From the moment Hulk Hogan stepped into the ring, he became a household name and the face of the entire wrestling generation. But beyond the body slams and leg drops, there's another side to the Hulkster, where the stories get bigger, the details get fuzzier, and the line between fact and fiction become blurred. So while his reputation has been tainted mainly due to the controversy surrounding him, it's still fascinating to hear Hogan sharing insane wrestling stories from his past. And kicking things off is with his backstage reputation for politicking, which is deeply rooted in his career. Particularly during his time in WWE, WWE and WCW, it's widely known that he aligned himself with those in power such as Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff to secure his status. And while this may have rubbed some wrestlers the wrong way, he openly admitted that it was Vince who gave him this power to influence backstage decisions. This was primarily due to the fact that when WWF was in its infancy, Vince McMahon didn't have that killer instinct in him and he relied on Hogan to be a backstage general. We did get really close the last five years. That's crazy that you're involved on like the business level like that. I didn't, I didn't want to be, bro. Was all wrestlers like that or like? No, it was just me because at first, when me and Vince first started this take over the world thing, if a guy didn't want to do a job, Vince didn't have that ironclad fist in the beginning. But he smartened up and realized, man, when I tell these guys something, they need to do it. You know, otherwise everybody's replaceable. When that happened, I went, thank God, you know, I don't have to be the bearer of bad news anymore. It only lasted for a couple of years. When I first started back in 84, it was like the lunatics were running the asylum. Believe me, it was nuts for a while. But Vince got a handle on it pretty quick. So while his influence backstage could have stemmed from his early days where he was exposed to this power, he would go on to further explain how things actually worked in terms of bookings in the 80s and mention the reason why wrestlers like Rowdy Rowdy Piper never won the WWF title is because he refused to do business and put people over, something that Vince despised. This was the actual reason why Macho Man Randy Savage was so heavily pushed as he was often by Hogan's side as he had a willingness to work with others as he would go on to explain. How did Vince like keep everything together? together yeah, he kind of grew into handling the situation and you know i was i for a long time i was kind of like um the bad news bear guy right? like for instance if i went to philadelphia and i was going to wrestle paul orndorff same situation paul orndorff mr wonderful and we'd planned on coming back three times if vince wanted me to beat him with the leg drop the very first time it really didn't make sense but as soon as paul got beat i was going to start posing and when paul started going down the aisle he was going to do the slow burn and turn around get my belt and clock me with the belt, beat the crap into me and land, leave me laying in a pool of blood so we could come back the next time, okay? Even though I won the match, you left me laying, you beat my ass, so let's put it in a steel cage or a bull rope match or a lumberjack match. There's a bunch of ways to make things happen. So I'd go to Paul and I'd say, Paul, Vince wants to do this, drop the leg, beat, come, you know, beat you one, two, three, come back, get the heat, hit me with the belt, boom, get some color, leave me fucking laying, brother. We're gonna come back and sell it out again. No, I'm not putting you over. What do you mean you're not putting me over? Well, I don't want to lose one, two, three, dude. Okay, so I called Vince up. Hey, Vince, just talk to Mr. Wonderful. He says he doesn't want to do the job, one, two, three. Okay, well, then if you don't want to do the job, you figure it out. Great. You know, that's how it was in the beginning. Yeah. Piper wouldn't do a job. Orndorff wouldn't do a job. The reason Macho Man Randy Savage was a champion so many times, he'd do business. If I said, brother, I need to beat you, you know, mm -hmm. he would be there. And then here's the belt. You know, I'm going to go do a couple of movies. Here's the belt. Go make a bunch of money. When I come back, I knew he'd drop the belt back to me. Yeah. But, you know, Vince didn't trust Piper or other guys that wouldn't do a job, so. But on the topic of willingness to work, there's no one that could come close to the leverage that Andre the Giant had in the 80s. And his match with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3 is one of the most legendary moments in wrestling history, symbolizing the peak of the golden era of wrestling. And as for the match itself, held in front of a record-breaking crowd, cumulated in an unforgettable moment when Hulk Hogan body slammed the 520-pound Andre the Giant before winning the match. This iconic feat solidified Hogan's state as a wrestling megastar. But it's crazy to think up until the event, there still wasn't a clear winner. Because in the 80s, usually the referee would be the one to tell the wrestler that he will be going over and how. However, in the case of the Hulkster versus Andre, that was still being decided. Especially with Andre, you know. And I did kind of irritate him a little bit. You know, usually they would come over to me or Andre and say, okay, you're going to beat Hogan tonight or Hogan's going to get counted out. I'd never beaten the Giant before. And there's no shame in getting beat by him because no one had ever beaten him. But, um, you know, Vince McMahon, I asked Vince, I said, well, you know, here we are the night before. What are we doing tomorrow? Vince goes, I don't know. But he goes, I'm sure Andre will do the right thing. I'm going, oh, great. Okay. So Vince wanted me to sit in the dressing room with Andre just to try to, like, make things cool. 
you know. But what was more interesting was the injuries that both men sustained during their bout that had everyone more concerned, as it's well documented that Andre was in bad shape going into WrestleMania 3, and taking a further knock to his back could have ended his career even sooner. As for Hogan, he explains that body slam nearly blew out his entire back. When I was sitting in the back with Andre, I was afraid that if WrestleMania sucked or the main event sucked, that would be it for the WWF. And so I sat next to Andre all day. Hey boss, what do you want to do? Don't worry. <laughs> okay, I'm not worrying. Hey boss, maybe later, me go up or me go down. Don't <laughs> worry. Andre, what do you think? Maybe we get things going in there and we get a little rhythm, maybe, maybe one slam if you're going to beat me. Don't worry. Okay, I'm worried. So we go to the ring. I don't know the finish. I don't know shit. All I know is I need to keep him close to the ropes because if you're in the middle of the ring, he can't stand up by himself without pulling himself up. So, you know, I get him in the ring and actually placement and maneuvering him around. If you ever watch the match, I keep him close to the ropes. And then there was, there was a spot in the match where when we got going, I don't know, I can't remember right now. I ran into him. I ran into him. Something happened. He didn't go down. He stayed close to the ropes. And I was backing off. He went, slow. And that voice there was just yelled slam. And he was just coming at me. You know, I tried earlier in the match, like 10 seconds in the match to pick him up. And I fell backwards. I almost broke my neck because he landed on top of me and didn't really protect me. You know, he squashed me. I barely got out from under him right in the very beginning. I went, oh, shit. He's not going for this today. So all of a sudden, when the match was almost over, he goes, slam. And I thought I heard what I heard. And as he came towards me, I took a step back and scooped him, but then got his momentum and I barely got him over. And then I went and I dropped the leg thinking that he was going to kick out and he didn't kick out. Did you fuck it? You fucked yourself up on that? Yeah. I tore my back. I got a hole in my back still from that shit. 620 pounds? Yeah. God damn. What, what, what happened after that? Cause that was a huge moment. Well, after that, you know, we went back to the dressing room and he was, he was hurting pretty bad. And, uh, you know, him and I had become really good friends at that point where the last 10 or 12 years, we were really, really close. Before that, we had some major issues. But um, at that point, you know, when I realized what he had done for me, mm -hmm. I mean, he just made my career there, brother. I mean, that, that was like, I was on a roll anyway. That was like hitting double nitrous buttons for me. But Hulk Hogan's contribution to WWF in the 80s wasn't done there. Because if there's one aspect WWE fans can all agree agree on is that when it comes to the theatrical side of things, ain't nobody doing stuff better than Vince and WWE. Their focus on the show being a spectacle for all is something else, and the major part of it is the entrances for the wrestlers. Who could forget such iconic moments like the Ultimate Warriors theme beaming throughout the stadium as he ran down the ramp, the Undertaker with the flame, smoke and classic gong, and finally Macho Man's entrance with the throne. But a major credit to all of this needs to be given to the Hulkster, as he played a crucial role in revolutionizing the use of entrance music in professional wrestling. Huh? So hear me out, when Hogan entered WWF in the early 1980s, he was given the entrance theme Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, which was already popular from the movie Rocky III where Hogan had a cameo. And while Vince McMahon Sr. had his reservation about using the theme track, Hogan knew that there was money to be made and it would help drive sales for merchandise as it would help pump up the crowd. And to be honest, he wasn't wrong. But he had their own way of trying to get over. I found out you know, if you really want to get over, it's that old saying, you know, you do it first and then ask for permission later to be forgiven later. Yeah. Because when I first went back in 84, they sold no merchandise, none. And when I was in Minnesota for three years, I was selling t-shirts and headbands. I was selling all kinds of merchandise, making crazy money. And when I went back in 84, they weren't selling any merchandise. And I was playing that Eye of the Tiger, that Dom. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. on the way to the ring in minnesota when i was with the aw and the place was electric and i went back to madison square garden and i said hey man can i play some interest music bad mistake asked him senior he said no so i ran to the sound guy gave him 500 bucks and said crank this shit when i come out what you know? and i figured if i got fired i got fired no big deal who gave a shit anyway and so you know he cranked the music that eye of the tiger shit hit and the roof blew off the garden and guess what everybody wanted entrance music after why, that. why would vince senior say no to that because they'd never done it before bro it was all old school respect garden boxing ding 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 all right in this corner everything was mundane everything was by road everything was the way it always had been yeah you know, nobody ever blasted music and blew the roof off the place. So how, how was it before you had a walkout and stuff? What's that? Like before you had a walkout in your song and your whole entrance, you guys just walked in. Like there was no senior? music back in the day. That's crazy. Yeah, it sucked. So, so, so then after that. Yeah, but it's easy to judge now. Yeah. You can sit here and judge now, but you guys weren't around back then. You know, shit just didn't happen. Like, you know, snap your fingers and play iTunes and, you know, go to the internet or whatever. Shit was different, man. It was a whole different 
train of respect and a line of respect that had been handed down for years and years and years. Vince McMahon's family, Vince McMahon Sr., his father and grandfather ran boxing in the garden. So while his contribution to the golden era of wrestling was invaluable, it's safe to say that it did come with a price. That being the need to constantly be the top guy meant that certain bridges had to be burnt. So as mentioned, we've heard several stories about how influential wrestlers held down talent in order to protect their spot within the company. This is something that affects the business a lot as the top guy remains in the main event scene longer than they should and the younger talent suffers in this ugly process. And as for Hulk Hogan, he was on top for years and there's a reason why he became the most recognized pro wrestler at the time. And that was by auditing and influencing backstage decisions in order to remain the golden goose. And he confirmed it himself in an interview with the Orlando Sentinel, Hogan admitted using politics to get ahead. By the way, in the same interview, they asked Hogan about all the stories of, about him over the years, holding down younger talent while he was on top. And he admitted that in fact, that is exactly what he did. This was his quote. He says, once I got in the spot to keep the spot, that's where the politics came in. Everybody goes, well, Hulk Hogan was a politician. Well, thank God I was. That's why I made more money than anybody. That's why I kept the belt longer. That's why instead of a five or six or 10 year run like The Rock or Stone Cold, I had a 35 year run on top. Now you know why Hogan rarely lost clean to other performers. And this is one of the major reasons why some performers never got along with him. But if there's one wrestler that managed to voice his Concerned during Hulk Hogan's reign, it would have to be Brett the Hitman Hart. I think he thought he was the big dog and the king dog in the company and anybody else. I don't think anybody, I think he had problems with Macho Man or Warrior or whoever else. He was a guy that thought he was everything in wrestling and that everyone else was we're all backup players to Hulk Hogan and that's the way he saw it. So Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan's animosity stems from professional jealousy, creative differences and key incidents that fueled their rivalry. Bret, who was a technically skilled wrestler, resented Hogan's larger than life persona and felt that Hogan was unwilling to pass the torch to a new generation of talent, including himself. But despite this, when asked about wrestlers that didn't like him, Hogan was quick to explain his perception in the locker room backstage. Who is your biggest like personal beef with outside the ring? Outside the ring? Well, it was, it was two guys. It was Macho Man. I mean, he lived on the beach here. We were together every single day. And then when he went through a divorce, <clears throat> he thought, I had something to do with it. That turned out to be like an eight year, don't talk to each other thing. So to sum up this rivalry quickly, their feud intensified after WrestleMania 9 in 1993, where Hart lost the WWE Championship to Yokozuna, only for Hogan to immediately challenge and win the title in a move that Hart saw as undermining his position and credibility of the belt. And stories have come out from both sides saying that Vince promised one thing to Bret Hart while Hogan was told something else. You know, like the Bret Hart thing, um, I really didn't understand because when he got pissed at me, you know, we basically, I won the belt from Yokozuna at a WrestleMania where Brett lost and I, Brett told me to go in the ring and wrestle him and I won the belt right after Brett wrestled him and then the deal was, was for me to drop it back to Yokozuna and then Brett got in my face and said, hey, you're supposed to drop the belt to me. I said, no, I'm not. He goes, well, yeah, you are. So let's go. Let's talk to Vince then. Yeah. So we both went in and sat down and talked to Vince. And Vince looked at Brett and said, Brett, that's what you thought you heard. So ever since then, he hated my guts and wanted to kill me. Then when he, then when Eric Bischoff asked me if I could work with him at WCW, I said, hell yeah, bring him in. I can work with anybody. All of a sudden, we had about eight or nine great matches. We got along great. We traveled together. We were eight or nine, ten good matches. And then when WCW was over, he hated me. I said, like, okay, you know, whatever. But it's just stuff like that, you know. So depending on who you believe when it comes to Hogan and stories, it's safe to say had he not played politics and stayed on top, we would have never gone one of the best WrestleMania moments when he met The Rock at WrestleMania 18. The match between the two was one of the most iconic counters in WWE history, famously billed as Icon vs Icon. The storyline saw Hulk Hogan returning as WWE as a member of the NWO, challenging The Rock, a top star from the Attitude Era. The build up on the match focused on the generational clash between Hogan Hogan, representing the past, and The Rock, the embodiment of the present and the future of WWE. But what made this feud interesting is that Hogan was well into his 50s at this point and made it clear that he didn't want to take a bump or fall up until the event itself. So when Vince asked him and the great one to do a rehearsal, you could kind of understand his hesitation to everything. I didn't say it, but if you want me to bring it, you're going to be asking me to take it back. You know, but I would never do anything under mine to, to hurt the boys or to hurt Rock. Yeah. But I just kept my mouth shut and the backstory still was, I think they didn't think I could pull it off. Or I think they thought that maybe I wasn't up to snuff to be Hulk Hogan, so they wanted me to go down to 
Miami and rehearse the match, which I've never done in my life. And so I went down there and Rocky Johnson was there, my boy, and Pat Patterson was there. And there was this ring in a warehouse and it was a hundred degrees plus. And The Rock told me everything he wanted to do and walk around and go here and there and spit his fist and he'd go over the top rope, go through all the stuff. The match was pretty much laid out. And then Pat Patterson said, okay, Telly, let's go to the match, Telly. And I went, are you kidding me? So if I fall down in here, I'm gonna get hurt. I can't wrestle with no people here. He goes, yeah, yeah, you got a Vince once you go to the match, so I can't do it. And as for the match itself, it went in a direction that nobody expected purely because of the crowd dynamic. Although Hogan was positioned as the heel in the event, the fans overwhelming support for him, cheering for his every move, while The Rock, the intended babyface, received a mixed reaction. Essentially it meant that it was a mix of classic wrestling psychology and larger than life moments. With both men feeding off of the crowd's energy and Hogan's take on the event, it's quite interesting to say the least. Bully expected to get booed. Come walking out the ramp, heard the crowd and went, oh my gosh, Lucy, we got a problem. You know, people were cheering like crazy, just loyal, you know, over the top loyal. Then we got in the ring and I remember we started and pushed him, we did the stare down. Yeah. Which, of course, we didn't rehearse that, that was just done. And then out of nowhere, you know, I think he pushed me or I pushed him, I can't remember. I know as soon as he started to take over on me, like he planned, the people started booing him out of the building. Then I cut him off and took over and it took me about seven or eight minutes to get it right. You know, and then we kind of slow danced through it. And it, it was a miracle. He, he was so good. He was so good with the timing and the placement and just the, you know, just to listen to the crowd with his ear and his heart. And once we got on the same page, I could have danced with him all night. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was just really easy. You know, it could have went either way, but it, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was just, it was, it was the art form again, which usually was, the art form is dead, but it, we went back to the dance of what this business is really about. There's a moment early on where you push him down and the crowd erupts yeah. in cheering. And you kind of look around almost like, oh, like, because yeah. you've been booed for the last six years, five years, yeah. whatever it had been. It's almost like, oh yeah, like that's what it feels like to be cheered again. Yeah, and it was it was really cheap heat for me to acknowledge the crowd, but I was just trying to get this thing to a fever pitch so that when he grinded me and beat me, he really beat somebody important. Mm. You know, I didn't want to pass the torch to some lukewarm, war, 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 worn out old wrestler. Yeah. I wanted to pass the torch to a guy that was like the biggest star in this business, and I just beat the biggest mm. guy ever in this business. That's where my mindset was. If we're going to send him off, let's make sure we send him off the right way. And I've never been in the ring with anybody that could call an audible like him and be that open and giving. You know, a lot of guys will freak out and yeah. tighten up on you and not go for a spot, but he was there for everything. And whilst it's easy to say that The Rock didn't necessarily need a passing of the torch moment, it's always good to see legends like the Hulkster giving him that moment. But as mentioned in that interview, Hogan stated that he's been working since the mid 70s. And by the time that he wrestled The Rock, he'd been working for almost 30 years. Damn. Which is why no matter how great of a pro wrestler you end up becoming and the legacy you leave behind, there will always be some things you might regret. Look at some of the biggest superstars like The Undertaker when he wrestled Goldberg in Saudi Arabia and Shawn Michaels when he's made his return at Crown Jewel. And let's not forget Bret Hart getting kicked in the head. As for Hulk Hogan and his regrets, he admits that the rings in the past had lumps and bumps coming out of them and that he regrets not changing his in-ring technique that he would have adapted to the nature of the awful rings that he competed in. And considering his finishes the atomic leg drop, it did a lot of damage on his spine as the years went by. So much so that he's actually shrunk in terms of height. So it's safe to say had the rings been a little bit better and the Hulks to change up his finisher, we might have gotten a few more years out of him. I know the leg drop doesn't look like a tough move. But most people don't realize is I started wrestling in 77. And at the end of the day, the equipment wasn't like it was. Like I remember wrestling in, in Andre in Baltimore. He goes, boss, don't fall down. It was a 22 foot boxing ring. And it was like a, a concrete road that had bumps and holes in it and lumps. I mean, it was the most dangerous ring I'd ever been in in Baltimore. And whenever I wrestle Andre there, he would say, do not go down. Mm. You know, because I had to wrestle more nights after that. He didn't want me hurt. And most of the equipment was just, every every ring was different. Now the WWE is so dialed in. They've got really good rings. They're all very consistent. It makes a big difference when you're in equipment that's really, really good stuff. So all those years dropping that leg in those rings, you know, yeah. with the board sticking up or, 
laying out on my tail, but oh my God, what was that, a rock in the ring? Oh my God, was that a board sticking out? Mm -hmm. All those years dropping the leg, I would have changed that and I would have never dropped the leg because at the time, my arms were almost 24 inches. I had like the largest arms in the world. You know, some people say I didn't, some people say I did, but my arms were big and yeah. I should have used the sleeper. No bump. Brutus, go figure out another finish. Greg Gagne, go take a hike. I should have, you know, stolen the sleeper and done that. Yeah. And I think I'd have been in a lot better shape. Which leads us to our final story of Hulk Hogan, of him not having a formal farewell or final match within WWE. You can argue that this is largely due to a combination of factors, including injuries, controversies, and timing of his exits from the company. So by the time Hulk Hogan's career was winding down in the mid 2000s, he was dealing with significant health issues, particularly with his back, which limited his ability to perform at a level expected for a high profile final match. Additionally, Hogan's relationship with WWE was often turbulent, marked with periods of departures and returns, which made it difficult to plan a definitive retirement match. Moreover, Hogan's legacy was also tainted by controversies, including a highly publicized legal battle with Gorka and the release of racial insensitive comments, which led WWE distancing itself from him for a period of time. These factors, combined with the evolving landscape of WWE and emergence of new stars, contributed to Hogan not having a formal farewell match within the company. However, when asked the question about having a final bout, his response is that it could have happened had the stars aligned correctly at WrestleMania 25 against John Cena of all people, as it would have been a perfect final passing of the torch moment for him. I feel like you should have one of those last matches against another one of the greats. I would have loved to have had that last match but now it's completely out of the picture. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm just too beat up from the surgeries and so. I think if I took a couple of bumps, you'd probably have to cut on me again. You know? <laughs> but no, I really wanted to have that last match. You know, against who? And I'm, I wasn't sure. You know, I, I had, I think it was WrestleMania 25 was in Orlando. So I think they talked with Cena, right? Yeah, and and Vince had me all hooked up with Cena, and I said I'd do it. And, Vince and I were talking every week and we were putting the plans together, you know, like the old days where I was in the office every day, him and I were talking every day. But all of a sudden I'm on the phone with Vince. I was like, oh, oh my God, oh my back. My back went out when I was talking to Vince on the phone. And I just had back surgery number three or four mm. at that time. And I had to go right in immediately and get cut on. Oh. So that was it for that. But I thought that was gonna be my last match then. You know, but that never happened and then it just kind of like faded away. If you liked the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and let me know what your favorite Hulk Hogan story is in the comment section below. And check out these other videos that we made of The Undertaker and Brock Lesnar revealing insane stories.